fresh out the sketchbook. All right. So this one's pretty involved. It's uh, Chewbacca and Han Solo. Nice little battle pose. Again, kind of like yesterday with the Princess Bride, you know, trying to vary where their heads are at to show the size difference. Let's see if we can get some of these small details worked out first. So I don't go blind and go mad and insane. So this is a oh, this is a sketch request I've kind of been admittedly putting off a little bit, just because all of Chewie's fur is always a little time-consuming and complicated, and so it's always easier to do the cartoonish stuff. But I finally said, okay, I better get this one done. Otherwise, I've been looking forward to it. That reminds me, we've got a, uh, a Rocketeer sketch coming up. That one's going to be a lot of fun. I was kind of debating whether I wanted to do like my version of the classic poster art or not. I think I'm going to do something else, but still looking forward to it. So I think that's kind of some of the most important part of his likeness. Yeah, so I was talking about the pencils. So this, this um, ebony, I really like the way the ink goes over top of the lead when it's done, but it's really smudgy. So I went back to the old Prismacolor Black for today, and then I have to figure out if I'm going to order some more or what. But. I don't know, that one just has its pros and cons. I think as like a pencil for an artist, it's a really good pencil. And you could either use an extra sheet of paper or a glove. But for live streaming, I think it's the lead is really soft. And it wants to break real easy and it wants to smudge real easy. And for live streaming, I don't really like to cover up the art too much unless I have to. So I don't know that it's, it's, it's a good art pencil. It just may not be good for that. So Chewy, you know, I would say characters, it's all about the eyes. And with him, I kind of like doing the eyes just like sunken in when I can. Uh, Peter Mayhew had such a distinct look to his eyes that when uh, uh, Junus is playing, Chewbacca, you can always kind of tell, you know, and so I just like to do them like dark and sunken in and in shadow when I can. It tends to work pretty well. So I'll try to nail down these facial features and then probably start working on all this massive fur. I'll probably do is you like do the silhouette or do the outline and then do all of what'll be like the darkest fur and maybe try to get some marker on that. It's just too easy to get confused. At least it is for me. I'm easily confused. All right. What took me to Arizona? Um, so grew up in the Kansas City area. Uh, moved to Seattle right after high school. Loved it there. Um, had some family members pass away, so I had to move back to Missouri. And then I, while I was there, enrolled in school and met my wife there. Um, she is an archaeologist, and her main area of study is in the Middle East and the deserts and stuff. And so she's really a desert dweller, and we 
both kind of wanted to get out of Missouri and kind of every place we talked about moving was, was warmer, you know, California, Florida, Texas, Arizona. So we came out here and visited some friends years ago and just kind of fell in love with the place and stayed. And we have so many clients in California and there's a lot of things that we both love in California. But it's just so expensive to live there. Um, I think we would just starve to death. So we usually, on a normal year, are out there quite a bit. You know, it's only like a six hour drive or whatever to LA. But, but really, the climate is what brought us here. I mean, you know. It sucks in June, July, and August when it's so hot, but the rest of the year it's really beautiful. And I don't, after about your third year here, you get acclimatized to the weather. And I don't think I could ever do like a real winter again. You know, I've had to go to Chicago in the wintertime or something for a convention and three or four days of that and I'm usually just sick in bed and shivering and cold and I was like no I'm, I'm done with that but yeah that's what brought us here It's worked out really well. You know, it's interesting. There's a couple of comic pros here. I mean, Todd McFarlane's here, who I don't really know personally. I mean, we've met a few times, but that's really all. Um, but Brian Polito is here. He's the creator of Lady Death, and I've had the pleasure to work with him off and on several times over the years and that's always a good time. You went to move to Arizona? You were in San Diego for 30 years and you moved because of the cost of living. Yeah, I believe it. You know, right now we kind of have a problem, well, before coronavirus at least, with people from California moving here in droves. And I totally understand why, because like you say, the cost of living. Um, but it's really messed up our real estate market here because, you know, someone in California sells their house for, you know, whatever it is, a million dollars or two million dollars or something crazy. and. They come here and as far as they're concerned, the houses are like free or cheap. And so a lot of them end up overpaying way more than anybody who lives here could or would afford. And so then it throws our real estate market into turmoil. It upsets the prices. And, and now we're in a situation where some people who've been here their whole lives can't afford to be here. So it's kind of weird how that works out. But yeah, I've got so many friends who who they they still, you know, live and work in LA or the LA area and I mean there's a lot of things to like about LA, but it's just it's just it would be a hardship for sure. San Diego is so beautiful. I uh, I imagine it must have been really hard to have to uh, to have to leave. It's, it's one of my favorite places. I remember. I think my first San Diego con was like 1998, and uh, I didn't have any money. But I joked. I was like, "Oh man, you know that gas lamp district was." not even at all revitalized yet and I was like gosh how cool would it be to buy some property down here 
boy, if I'd only had the means, because now anybody who bought down there back then, I'm sure they're doing just fine now. You have a really cool really cool artist area or something in your town now. Yeah, I mean, you can't go wrong with the Pacific Northwest. I mean, when I was in Seattle, it was just such a, such a cool place. A different kind of climate, but like anything else, once you're used to it, it's not that big of a deal. There's so much going on with this. I'm like, I don't even know where to start. Oh yeah, Mike Elrod, yeah, and Laura. You used to be able to walk up and get tickets at the front door of San Diego. That's crazy, right? I mean, can you even imagine now? first started going to San Diego Comic-Con when Wednesday night wasn't preview night it was industry preview night like there was no public allowed in and uh, that was the night that you showed your comics and stuff to the retailers and the retailers just walked around and the publishers had their booths open and would show retailers sneak peeks of stuff and have artists and guests out there for the retailers to talk to and there was no sales or commerce being conducted but I'm sure there were deals being put together between the retailers and the publishers it was really different back then for sure I want some of this fur to come down into his forehead a little bit more so you get that swoop, swoopy motion kind of going, you know. I think that's going to be important. Hopefully once I grab the brush pen we can make make this fur kind of flow and have some organicness to it. That'll be the goal at least. Timothy Zane lives a couple of hours away. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Or Timothy Zahn, right? I keep thinking I met him once at one of the events, but I'm just not sure. I meet so many cool authors. It's hard to keep them all straight. And then I'll, you know, people like my wife or someone who reads a lot more than I do, they'll be like, oh my gosh, you met that person? And that's kind of the funny thing about comics. There's all these like little mini celebrity fandoms, you know, based on whatever it is, writing or art or animation, voice acting. Like I 
like I wouldn't know, you know, any anime voice actor probably by name, but there's just so many of them that are so famous. the voices but I probably wouldn't know by name Oh yeah, Alex Sinclair, yeah. He's great. And I know he used to hang out at the zoo a lot and do like his animal paintings and stuff there. I think he would even do like animal art classes at the zoo, which I always thought was pretty cool of him to do. He's a super, super duper good guy. people in, in this business some are some are really cool and some are not and he's definitely one of the cool ones but what I always say is that most of us became artists because our communication skills <laughs> were lacking in other areas and you know art was how we could communicate so sticking an artist up on a stage and having us talk or sign autographs or you know whatever it can sometimes be a double-edged sword because we're not used to being out with the public all the time and some people are definitely better at it than others So the thought process here is that like as the light comes down the face, there'll be more shadow down here. And then we'll have like a highlight across the top edge of the bowcaster and then down to some more shadow. And then Chewie's arm is like coming down this way. And so it'll be the same kind of thing, like a rim light and then more shadows. So hopefully that helps us get like the face, the bowcaster, the arm, and it'll all work together. But uh, getting it kind of to that point it's kind of like makes your brain hurt but I think like a lot of these once we get that heavy black shadow down then it starts to starts to fall into place I think with so much art there's that early stage where you're like I don't know if this is going to work I don't know if this is you know going to look like that thing it's supposed to look like and usually it's like halfway through or more before you can kind of like relax and be like oh okay yeah it's it's looking like that thing it's supposed to look like and that's always the good moment <laughs> thank you McCruthers oh yeah so I am um, oh Alex is the one that told you you had to learn how to cut and grad. Yeah, for sure. Like, cut and grad and cut and brush are great techniques that, you know, they, how do I put this? You'll hear me say this a bunch in the Photoshop class, but people confuse technique and style, and it'll happen. You'll, you'll, you'll see it happen in the class, I guarantee it. Um, but like someone was asking just the other day about using the feather on the lasso and you know you know we'll get there we'll talk about it or whatever but that person I, I, I don't know them so I'm only assuming right now but I'm assuming they're thinking about something about style and the, the truth is is once you learn the technique the goal isn't to like you know 
copied my style or Alex's style or anything like that. The goal is to then take that technique and use it to figure out, you know, how, do, how, does it, how you can apply that and other techniques to, to make your style. And, you know, if you look at like some of the stuff that uh, Josh Jensen's been, uh, been posting, um, you can see the change, right, in his work as he started to incorporate, you know, a little bit of texture or a little bit of, of this or a little bit of that. And he's like finding his way, you know. And that's that's kind of fun to, to see that progression and watch watch it happen. Because that's the challenge, you know, you can learn a technique and and do nothing with it, right? Which is what happens to some people. Or you can learn a technique and then apply it, and that's kind of when the you know, when the magic happens and the good stuff starts to come. And some some people get there quickly, and some people never get there. I mean, and it's kind of cool to have like a signature style, but also to be flexible and you know know how to adapt as needed. That's kind of a big thing too. All right, I kind of feel like we're getting to a place where I can start to get out some of the black pen and start working some of this out. I think so. All right. Hi, Monique. Thanks for hopping in. Cornbread, huh? Uh, so our our warm up sketch was uh, uh, an Ahsoka, Padawan Ahsoka. That was really fun. Working on this really insane uh, Han Solo and Chewbacca right now. And so that's going to be the main sketch of the day, and um, and then we're going to do the cool down sketch. It's going to be a mashup, is all I will say right now. Star Wars and something else. <laughs> but um, as you can tell, this one's. It's going to be a little complicated, but uh, it should be fun. The trick here is just going to be to start inking in some of Chewie's fur, try to get some of the like really dark areas blocked in, and that'll make it easier to visualize where some of the you know gray values and lighter areas will need to be. Chewbacca is always kind of a challenge in that way. But I hope you're good. I hope your cornbread turns out good. When I started working on um, some of the research and concepts and stuff for your sketch, so it's, uh, it's definitely in the queue. So that'll be coming. Uh, It'll be coming next week for sure. I still don't know if it'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but I think I might do yours on the same day we do the Rocketeer, but we'll have to wait and see. So with Chewbacca here, like I said, we'll just kind of have these like dark parts of the fur. It's almost like combing your hair, it like brushes up his forehead. And then as it goes down, it's almost like a, a long beard. It starts to stream off of his face a little bit. I'll just try to indicate that a little bit with the inks. His eyes, it's almost like a sheepdog. You know, you don't really see the eye, you just see like this 
kind of a little sunken in area cover with fur and that's what makes it work. Thank you, Monique. Thank you, Evan. So tell me what you guys are up to. I know you're baking, you said. That sounds good. Now if you're, are you making cornbread to go with like a meal or something? Or is this cornbread or something else? Seems like everybody's baking during the quarantine. My wife said she found flour at the store for the first time yesterday since this started. I think she had been able to find some like weird flour, but not the normal flour until yesterday. Evan's been coloring, that's good. Keeping up on your practice. What do you think about those, um, those battle pug pages, Evan? Do you have any thoughts on how you're going to eventually approach those? We haven't talked about them beyond just flatting yet, but there's definitely lots of possibilities there. trying to rough in it's almost like Chewy's jawline right here so I want there to be a little bit more of these like shadow bits in the fur down here and then they'll flow and it kind of just over you know runs into where like the bow caster is so we just really just need a couple little like reversed out lines for the bow caster I really want most of the back of the bow caster to just kind of melt into the background of his fur so we just need to imply just a few little details. And that should get us where we need to be on that. Because the really cool part of the bowcaster is down here, and that's that's all anybody wants to see. complimentary coloring scheme yeah that could be cool have you thought about like a uh, time of day or anything like that talking to Christy and I about doing the class again in the next section and uh, we told them we would but I know they have a lot of people that are wanting to learn uh, Clip Studio and I said no I'm not I'm not I'm not good enough to have Clip Studio students and Photoshop students in the same class I think that would be I think it would just become like a technology class we'd be spending most of our time explaining how to do each step in each different piece of software and not enough time creating. So I said, let's just keep this one focused on Photoshop. And I get it, I mean, there's a, a definitely a demand out there for Clip Studio. You're gonna do yours as a night scene? Cool, I like that idea. I think that's smart. But I saw that Dutch was doing some Clip Studio stuff on his uh, Twitch last night. And 
he was saying the thing that I was most concerned with, which is that, you know, while it's inexpensive to own and use, and it does a lot of cool things, if you want your comic in print, you still got to take it into Photoshop and mess with the colors and get it all dialed in to print. So, you know, I think it's a great piece of software and really good for a lot of people, but from the like professional perspective, it's just not quite there, I don't think. And that doesn't mean that pros aren't using it, because I know there, I know several who are, but it's kind of like me and Procreate. I still have to throw it back into Photoshop when I'm done to get it ready for, for print. You guys probably can't hear it, but my, my next door neighbor who does his daily leaf blowing, he's at it right now. He just started. It's a little late for him. He usually does it like between noon and one every day. I never know if he's bored or he just cares that much. I guess kudos to him for wanting to keep his patio and driveway and everything blown off. <laughs> it usually happens right when I want to stream or you're on a Zoom call or something, you know. Christy was on some like super important Zoom meeting one day to do with her PhD and he started up and I thought she was going to lose it. <laughs> All right, so because I don't want to drag my hand through the inks, I think I will just finish this little top edge of Chewy here and then we can go in and start laying in some, some dark black on him. So I'm kind of figuring out all this Twitch stuff as we go. And one of the conditions is you have to have a day where at least five people are chatting at the same time. And so yesterday we hit six people at the same time. So that was good news because they kind of rank you based on interactivity. And so the next goal is I'm supposed to get at least 50 followers on Twitch. I think I'm currently like 31 or 32. So I have to work on that. But that, that would put me at like the, the minimum basic Twitch channel. Right now I'm not even that. I was talking to some other artists and they're like, oh yeah, I hit all the goals my first week or whatever. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good for you. This goes back to what I said yesterday about not being good enough at self-promotion. I tend to just focus on the artwork and not do enough of the other stuff. Go Chewy, go! See, I should have just done like a super cartoonish version like my Chewy here. That would have been easier, right?
once we get all this black ink laid in hopefully this thing will start to come alive I think with Chewy if we do like two maybe three shades of gray on the fur it'll really start to look cool Thank you, thank you, Evan. Yeah, I was watching a friend's Twitch stream last night and she had like 126 people on chat at the same time. And I was like, yikes, she's good. I think she's been at it for years since like Twitch started gaming and art. All right, let's get the big, the big fat tip here. You can almost hear Chewy roar. I can't do the Chewy voice or I would do it for you. Back from your nap back at work cool thank you thanks for checking in well you can see how things are going here we're uh, working on Chewbacca's fur but I take it you're working from home like everybody else I think Arizona there was some talk about some businesses reopening tomorrow Friday but our governor, I think, came out yesterday and said, no, let's play it safe and let's wait till the 15th. And I mean, I, I don't want anyone to, you know, lose out on work and all that. But at the same time, I think, I think playing it safe makes a lot of sense right now. So it's a hardship for sure. Hopefully we'll save some lives though. Well, I hope you had a good nap, especially after being up since 3.30 in the morning, man. Nothing's worse. Nothing sucks more than that when you fast asleep and something or someone or some animal wakes you up. And if you can just roll over and go back to sleep, it's fine. But it's, man, when you can't go back to sleep, it's so frustrating. You know, I don't know about you guys, but like my brain starts working and thinking about all the things I have to do and deadlines I need to make and bills I need to pay and all that stuff and I just it just gets to be just impossible to go back to sleep let's go Chewbacca go go Chewy So hopefully you can see like how this is going to work now so that the shadow on the bottom edge of the bow caster um, will separate from like the top of the arm here. And that should give us a little bit of, of uh, you know, a little overlap there to create some visual depth. And you'll notice that um, I had a little talk with the chat bot last night. And so the character limit before he yells at you is now like 500 characters. Apparently the default setting is only like 144 or 104 or something like that, which seems ridiculously low to me. So, so far so good with that.
I'm kind of in this weird situation where I'm I'm still running from the regular OBS streaming software, but I've activated my Streamlabs account, and so the Streamlabs chatbot is checking in on us, even though I'm not streaming off their software just yet. So hopefully next week I'll have it all set up, and if you look like just below the screen, let's see, just below the screen, there should be a little like official art store badge down there now. Um, so that's new and hopefully by next week we'll have the Facebook badge and the commission sketch commission badge and some of that stuff. But I'm figuring it out. Normally I'm the kind that would try to figure everything out before I started, but the minute this crisis hit, I was like, I've got to get off my butt and get to work. Find some new, some new way to create some art. All right, so we can start to see what's going on with Chewbacca there. I hope that, I hope that reads to you guys. So I think we can get Han kind of up to the same level and then we can start working in some of the gray shading on them and stuff. You notice the chat bot not yelling at you? <laughs> it's always a good thing when it's not yelling at you. This um, the person who requested this one wanted to Han and Chewie, and I was really trying to come up with something, some dynamic shot with them, and so much of the reference I found was like really static, and so I found this old, a couple old photos I was working from, and was happy to have something where they're kind of in like an action-y pose. So um, Quench Press, what's going on in the um, in the music world today? I was listening to oh, I can't think of who it was. Some artist who was talking about they've been doing their um, like a daily live stream with two or three other artists, and so what they're doing is like. You know, on Tuesday, artist A starts writing a song and gets however far along they get. And then on Wednesday, artist B has to pick up where artist A left off on that song. And so forth and so on until the song is done. I think they're doing one a week or one a day or something. I think it's, I think each of them participate every day, but they end up with one new song a week or something. I don't know. I didn't get all the details, but. It sounded really cool. I was like, oh, that's something that you'd be into. Um, it reminded me of how I used to do art in like high school because we, my friend Cartoon Rick, who was on here one time, you know, we had, we had like two classes together and then the rest not. And so one of us would start a piece of art in the morning and then the class we had together, we'd hand it off to the other person and they'd work on it. And the, later in the day, then the other class we had together, they'd you know, hand it back or whatever. And so by the end of the day, we'd have a finished piece of artwork. I mean, high school art, you know, nothing professional. But it was always so much fun to, you know, set up the drawing and hand it off and see what that other person did with it. And I always liked that collaborative process. And I always wondered if that's not one of the reasons I was kind of fell into comic books. It was because of stuff like that. I had so many people I knew in college that were in art did not want to collaborate. They didn't like group projects. They didn't 
they didn't play well with others. They even if they weren't good artists, they just wanted to do their own thing. They didn't want to have anyone else have any influence over them or anything, you know. And I was the opposite. I was always like, you know, let's let's team up. Let's do something together or something cool or let's put on our own gallery show or whatever. And I found very few people are receptive to that kind of thing. So whether it's a musician or a visual artist, I just think it's it's really cool when they have the I don't know, confidence maybe is the right word. You know, you have to be confident enough to be like, yeah, I can collaborate with you and whatever we do will be cool. I think it's oftentimes people who are insecure, you know, who don't want to collaborate. I mean, I guess it could be that they're like creative geniuses and they don't think you're good enough but to work with them, but I think most of the time it's people who are insecure. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't catch the artist's name. I was I was in the car at the time, so I was just kind of like half listening. And now I can't remember if it was like if it was Alt Nation or if it was like um, First Wave or what it was. But That's cool. So since I'm drawing Han Solo, did you guys hear about Harrison Ford's latest airplane mishap? I heard he had one, but I haven't checked out the details yet. I don't think it was like a real crash like a year or two ago, but something happened. Almost have Han ready to start throwing some ink down or some fill in the blacks on him. Almost. Yeah, I'm with you. I saw the headline, but I didn't read the article either. Something happened. I saw lots of Millennium Falcon jokes and stuff going around about it. I can do this without smearing any of this ink anywhere. There's no undo button on my sketches. That sucks. I'm gonna get Mike Nesmith to sell me some white out or liquid paper, I guess, was his mom's invention, right? Hey, um, Quinch Press, are you, um, how do you feel about the monkeys? When this lockdown started, I was kind of surprised to see that they weren't streaming on any services. But, uh, all the episodes are on YouTube. And so that took me down the rabbit hole of, like, documentaries and stuff about them. And, uh. I don't know if it made me like them more or less, but it was interesting nonetheless to see a just how crazy famous they were back in the day, more so than I ever realized, um, and b just like what a train wreck. You know their uh, lives off the show. You know the, the dynamic between them was. Kind of seemed like they really, 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 really wanted to be like the Beatles, and they just couldn't be happy being themselves, you know. Oh, good. I'm glad you love the monkeys. Yeah, I I watched it when I was young, and uh, 
I seem to remember having like their LPs and stuff. And so I've, I've gone back and picked up a few of them on YouTube. Kind of feel like you can only watch maybe two or three of them in one sitting before you're just like done for the day. But oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, well, I don't know if you have you seen those documentaries about them or anything. I I think I watched like two document or listened to two documentaries, and um, then there was one like made for TV movie about them with other actors playing their parts and stuff, which was kind of crazy. Like it wasn't well made, but it was still interesting. But like I never realized that they didn't even own the name the monkeys. They had to like, you know, pay a licensing fee to use the name when they would go touring and stuff. That's gotta be really strange. Well, if you're bored and you get a chance, like, you know, the nice thing about it is it's not anything you have to watch. You can just listen to it while you're doing other work. But you know how YouTube is. I mean, just once I found one thing of theirs to listen to, it just kept recommending more and more. and. Show me stuff I didn't even know existed. But someone created a playlist. They have all the episodes in order. And some of them have, um, not commercials, but they have like the, I guess some of the early episodes were sponsored by like uh, Kellogg's or something. So they have the little like lead ins and stuff with the monkey singing like a Kellogg's spot or something. I'd never seen those. And there's like little outtakes at the end right before the credits that um, I guess that's how they aired live in the 60s, which is like long before I was born. But um, so when I saw them in, in reruns as a kid, that, that stuff had been taken out. And so I had never seen any of those little end sequences before. Oh, Twitch is running rough. Okay, no problem. Thanks for joining us. Uh, enjoy your cornbread and bean soup, and you have a great night too, Monique. All right, we're getting there with this black ink. You know, it takes a while, but it's uh, it kind of becomes the foundation, you know, for the whole rest of the illustration. So this is the part that if I don't rush this part too much, it pays off later. <laughs> Bye, Monique. What year was I born? Ha! Huh. Like, I'm a sucker who's going to tell that. I work in the comic book industry. I'm, I'm perpetually 19 years old, no matter how old I look. I'm a Gen Xer, if that gives you any clue, though. Spin the paper, I'm doing it. Gotta do it. Everybody's least favorite. I remember when I first got into comics. I got in when I was 19, but I didn't really hit you know, for years, and so I was in my early 20s, uh, 23 or 24 or something. That's when I met 
Marty Nodell and a bunch of the kind of golden age comic creators and stuff, usually up at like Chicago Comic Con. And they would tell me all these stories about how the industry chewed them up and spit them out. Yeah, I think I think all of us are into the same things. We're all about the same age. All right. So, yeah, I think that's like the the dark black area is done. So we could take that and start working in some some gray values. I probably just want to lay down a little bit more pencil on Han just to define some of his features a little bit. And then with Chewbacca, I'll probably just go in there with the marker and just start doing the fur. We might need a little pencil on the bow caster, but hopefully not too much else. I mean, I'm assuming most of us were around when there was just like, you know, three channels on television and all that jazz. Hey, Decidious, how are you doing? Welcome back to the party. Got a little Chewbacca Han Solo action going here today. Just in time for some, uh, just about ready for a lot of the marker shading. Trying to rough out some of these folds in the fabric here. do some little wrinkles and stuff here. Thank you. It's uh it's getting there. I knew this one would be a challenge just because well it's two characters and anytime you've got Chewbacca you might it's he alone is like doing more than one character so but thank you for that. I appreciate it. All right, so we got Han's finger here, Han's thumb, this other finger here. I think the rest we can do just some marker shading, hopefully. All right, so I think for Han, let's start out with just a super light, like, like a 20 probably, maybe even a 10. Start with ten. Thanks to Sidious. Hope you're doing good today. Seems to be a good day, productive day. Getting things done. So we were talking a little bit about um, the Monkees TV show right before you got here, Decidious. Was that um, one that you ever watched? 
either on like some local station or MTV or something. I always thought they were really funny. And this documentary I was watching was saying that uh, when they played in England, they got to they got to meet the Beatles, and the Beatles were like telling them how much they liked them and how funny they thought they were. But all the monkeys wanted to hear was that you know, they wanted to be like musically as good as the Beatles, and it sounds like they had a quite a frustrating career. It's gotta be weird to be like that successful, but you can't appreciate it or recognize it because you're always looking at the thing that you're not doing, you know? Yeah, I think it was before all of our time, but it seems to seem to play a lot when I was a kid on like local TV and stuff. See if this is dark enough for this or not. Yeah, exactly. They were they were made for television. Yeah, the documentary I watched was kind of cool because it was showing how Mike Nesmith and Peter Tork were, um, you know, musicians, whereas like Davy Jones and, uh, crap, Mickey Dolans were actors and how they put them together to hope one would compliment the other. And in the documentary, they show uh, some of the other actors. And so there's like audition footage with like, you know, two people you recognize and two people you don't recognize that, you know, that had audition for the parts and stuff. But they seem to have like really tormented lives. Like Mike Nesmith's wife like died in a car crash or something, so. Lots of, lots of tragedy, it seemed like. I might want this eyebrow to be a shade darker, but we can always go darker, so that's not a problem. So they were in the 60s, huh? Okay, that makes sense. It's so weird, you know, like when I was a kid and there were Saturday morning cartoons and everything. I didn't know how much of that stuff was already, you know, 10 years old or whatever, because it's the first time I'd ever seen it. And it's kind of the same thing with the monkeys. I mean, I realized when I watched them that they looked, you know, their hair and their clothes didn't look right, but I guess I was too young to know, like, 
how old it was or whatever. So what else are you guys uh, watching or listening to right now? Or if um, if you were a Harry Potter character, what what house would the Sorting Hat put you into? And be honest. Gryffindor, okay. Why do you think that is? What qualities make you a Gryffindor? sorting hat be like how did that Jedi get in here that's a great answer I love it I was waiting for someone to refuse to play I don't know enough about the the houses. I, I don't know if I'm a if I'm a Ravenclaw maybe. I don't know. Which which house has like the the best art supplies and the best snacks? And I'm there. Like everybody else is out playing Quidditch and I'm just like chilling and drawing and stuff. Oh, here's one. Did any of you guys see um, the new Jay and Silent Bob movie? What did you think about it? You can't just say you saw it. You have to like, you know, share your opinion and stuff. You can't go all Silent Bob on us. You were a Hufflepuff? Oh, that's cool.
you know the artist that did the comic on Chasing Amy. Oh, that's cool. Well, I don't think you're wrong, Quinch Press. Um, I kind of feel like if you've seen all the other Askew Universe movies, it's 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 worth watching. Just you know, there's a ton of inside jokes and callbacks and stuff like that. But if um, if this was like your only experience with it, you would be like, what? Why am I watching this? I mean, I kind of feel like it was Kevin Smith's, like, love letter to his daughter, you know, in a way. And so it was kind of sweet from that standpoint. Um, there's, like, a ton of cameos from, like, all the people who've been in all those other films and stuff. But, you know, was it as good... I don't think so. I mean, like, if this was his first film, I don't, I don't think people would be giving him the same, you know, the same shot he got off of like Clerks and stuff and Chasing Amy. So, but from like a sentimental kind of nostalgic standpoint, it was worth watching. Yeah, you definitely have to have seen the others. To, yeah, I agree with that 100%. Like, I can't imagine anybody who hasn't seen the others, like, firing it up and, like, sitting through it and thinking, like, this is great. It was really sweet, like, the Stan Lee bit they showed at the very end during the credits. What about Dante? Oh, well, that's cool. I'm glad you got to meet him and talk. That's really cool. I mean, isn't that like the best thing about comics is just getting to meet artists and writers and actors and stuff? It's such a small world. Like, you just never know how that interaction is going to affect things later on, you know. Alright. I think Han's starting to come together there. Was this one to 20? 20? Yes. Let's give him a little bit more
Never tell me the odds, kid. Has anybody ever been in a movie? Uh, my art's been in movies and TV shows, but I don't think I have. I had a chance to be in uh, Alan Tudyk's Con Man TV show, but I couldn't make it out there that weekend. What about what about you other guys? Been in a movie, anybody? I mean, I know Quinch Press is Instagram famous for a lot of bands, musicians that he hangs out with, but I don't know about anybody who's been in a movie. <laughs> not, not in real life. Okay, Chewbacca, I think it's your turn, finally. Let's go with some darker fur values for Chewy here. Oh, this is what, 70 or 80? 70? Let's try that. Oh, in a Chuck Norris film? That's cool. That's really cool. Oh, thank you, Evan. So, um, thank you. I I struggle with his, with Harrison Ford's likeness probably more than any other. So, even if it's close, I'll be happy with it. I kind of feel like he's looking a little more like Ralph Garman than Han Solo right now, but I'll live with it. So no other no other movie stars. I'll let the pros be in the movies. I uh, I was too much of a ham. I'd always get in trouble and like theater and stuff or trying to get a laugh out of the audience so I think after like my sophomore year they stopped putting me in the plays they're like you can just do the set designs and stuff 
Go do the makeup. Like you're not taking this seriously enough. I was like, it's it's school. Why would I? It's not real. Oh, did any of you guys see the new Harley Quinn film? I think we should talk about that. And Chewie's got kind of like his jawline down here, so you know, want there to be like extra little like furry, wispy, shadowy bits rolling down his chin. All right, so somebody who's seen Harley, tell me what you thought about it. And I'll let you guys know what I thought. It was the last movie you saw in the theaters. I'm sorry. liked it. Okay. Yeah, more of a more of an intro. I, I'll give you that. I mean, I love the source material. I love, love, love Harley Quinn. And I love Jimmy and Amanda's take on her in the in the comics. And I felt like the movie, like the, the set design was so good. I mean, some of the art direction was just phenomenal. And there's just so much to like. But I really felt like what the, the movie makers were trying to make was like a female Deadpool. It, especially with like Harley doing the narration, some of that kind of stuff. It really felt like that. And from, from that standpoint, I don't know that it was successful. Like, you know, was it as good as Deadpool? Did it make as much money as Deadpool? Is it as popular as Deadpool? Which is probably like how the movie studio was judging it, you know? And so from that standpoint, I, I just don't know that it did what it needed to do. Um, but yeah, Margot Robbie was great. And... Um, most of the other actors and stuff in it were great. And like the actor who plays the, the Huntress, um, um, I'm blanking on her name all of a sudden, but she played Ramona Flowers and uh, Scott Pilgrim. You know, I usually really like her. I felt like they didn't give her enough to do compared to like the Huntress and the comic books and stuff. So I don't know. I'm, I'm maybe, I, don't, I didn't hate it, but I just. I wanted it to be more than it was, I think, you know? Does that make sense? Like, there was just so much potential there, and such a popular character, and I kind of feel bad for Margot Robbie. I think she, like, produced it, and I know it, it kind of flopped at the box office, so. Yeah, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, yeah, she's she's always good. And I don't know who who played um, Canary, but I thought she did a really good job. I was I was... It was a different take on the character, and I was kind of impressed with, with how that went. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I get where. I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, I get where the people who didn't like it or what their complaints were. I can I can see all of those things being, you know, valid, and I can see where the the studio was maybe not happy with how it performed. It just makes you wish that uh, 
Um, wasn't Huntress the daughter of Batman and Catwoman? Um, I don't, not at least not in the version of the comics that I worked on. But you know, some of those characters get different origin stories with different creative teams and everything. So I'm looking at the feed and this is what, 70% gray? I think on cam it looks a little dark compared to the black, but in person there's a nice bit of contrast there. And so I think if we just go to like 50 for the next level, um, it should look pretty good. And that 50 will blend with the 70 just a little bit, so we should get some, some decent like fur look coming out of that. I think Mary Elizabeth Winstead was in Sky High, um, which I kind of feel like is an underrated hero film. I mean, it kind of came out before the genre had really exploded, you know. Yeah, I remember there was a uh, Birds of Prey TV show. I remember that because I think um, one of the actors from uh, Starship Troopers played Barbara Gordon. Oracle in that series. And I thought she was pretty good in it. I wasn't as impressed with the actor they had playing Canary in that TV series. She was really young and played it kind of weird, I thought, but I'm sure they had their reasons. But I remember the TV version of Huntress being pretty good. Oh, I didn't know that about Die Hard. I guess I didn't pay attention to that. She definitely seems to have been popping up in a lot of the genre films, though. All right. Yeah, that's starting to starting to come together there. Well, I've got this one out. We can just do some big, bold, dark strokes down here at the bottom. Yeah, Mia Sarah was in that. I forgot about her being in that. Gosh, whatever happened to her? I totally forgot that she was in that. Just talking about Mia Sarah makes me want to go back and watch Legend again with Tim Curry.
Oh, she married Brian Henson, huh? Well, that's cool. Look at the big brain on you. Now that Disney owns Marvel and Star Wars, we just need like Chewbacca to have like a fight scene against the Hulk or something. Like a crossover. For charity though, you know, of course. What is the key command to make a straight line with the brush? Um, shift. You just hold the... So you can do two things. You can hold the shift key down while you drag the brush and it just drags in a straight line. Or you can tap the brush down and then press the shift key, I think. Or is it maybe it's option. And wherever you tap the brush next time, it'll make a perfect line to that, kind of like the lasso tool. It's definitely shift to drag it. It might be option to tap it. Because I think with the, with the brush or the pencil, you can tap just like with the lasso, um, only you're drawing instead of making a selection. <laughs> Loan me your copy of Legend. I don't think I have anything to play it on. I have to stream it or something. I was joking with Christy, I was like, we have a whole cabinet of like DVDs and stuff still and no, nothing to play it on. Oh good Evan, I'm glad that worked. One thing you can count on me is keyboard shortcuts. So once we get this one wrapped up, I've got just a real super easy, fun uh, little Star Wars mashup one to do. Just trying to work out kind of the last of this dark fur here. Leaving some areas I want to stay open. So we have room for a little bit of some lighter values in there.
want to keep the lightest areas of the fur on the face and that'll really help two things help direct the eye towards his face and help Han kind of pop forward off of all this dark dark fur on Chewie here so those two things will kind of work hand in hand is 70 so we're going to go down to a 50 for our next shade and I need to touch this up to oh thank you Evan all right so yeah so this is the 50 so again, just trying to keep the, the majority of the light kind of around Chewy's face here. And we'll use this 50 to blend some streaks of fur up into the 70 that we just did. streaks there. This one's definitely kind of got the look and feel of like a, a real convention sketch, you know. Just kind of freehanding a lot of this fur with the marker. Just trying to let it happen. A great Chewie and Luke Skywalker. That's that just tells you how good the likenesses are not. <laughs> That's hilarious. Something like that. She says they both have the same hair. It's true, right? I think they, well, this isn't a gun. This is the hair dryer. It's the hair dryer that they both use to look fabulous.
<laughs> it's their pew pew thing. Yeah, that's for sure. And I think as we go down into sort of the beard area, um, the strands can sort of start to get like longer. So, you know, he's got like much shorter for around the face. But as it comes down, it starts to get like a little longer and not really stringy so much, just, you know, bigger clumps of longer fur. So that we can start to kind of get these like, uh, there's like some of these longer strands going. I think by the time we get down here, then we can just kind of fill in some of the light areas with this value. Over here as well. So there'll be a few small little lights. And a little more as we work our way up into this area. I think we just do like one more level of shading on his fur and then clean up the bow caster and we'll just about be there. So this was 50. So let's go down to 30. And let's just do a few little, just a few little touch-ups to the face and the hair here. Just let it blend a little bit. Especially right through here. So I want the bowcaster to be a little bit lighter than Chewy is.
I have a favorite colorist? Sure. Um, so, digital wise, um, Steve Olaf is like the whole reason I got into any of this stuff. So, he ran Ollie Optics Color Studio, and he was, I think, the first Eisner Award winner for digital color. Um, a bunch of other things like that and he had his own software called tint prep it was sort of a very basic vector coloring and he did Akira and some Batman books with that and, uh, that was the first time I ever saw a gradient the first time I ever saw anything that was digitally colored it blew my mind and you know it, it made a big influence on me for sure so he would have been digitally the person who influenced me a lot. Um, traditional colorist, Adrienne Roy, like all the way. She's a master of warm and cool. I own some of her color guides and color separations. I met her before she passed away. and um, She kind of colored all the, all the comics that I read as a kid, all the DC stuff at least, and um, just loved loved her work so you know those would be the two for sure um, and then digitally I mean I'm in love with the work of like pretty much all my contemporaries so you know you could pretty much name it and it'd be somebody whose work I admire but Laura Martin is probably the one who spent the most time with me early on and really gave me a lot of pointers and things that put me going in the right direction guys there's Han and Chewie you uh, see anything I missed there I usually spot one or two things but grab me a second or give me a second and I will grab our final one of the day it's gonna be a fun little mashup and uh, it'll go pretty quick I think thanks for sitting with me through this one though I know it was a long one